Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm speaking with Rob Dunn. Rob is the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor and Senior Vice Provost for University Interdisciplinary Programs at NC State University. He's a PhD in Ecology and Evolution from the University of Connecticut, and he is interested in studying the world around us. Um, whether it's you know species that we think about or those that we don't, those that are in our backyard, those in our bedroom, and just about the world around us. Um, he's the author of a few books, the most recent being a Natural History of the Future, What the Laws of Biology Tell Us About the Destiny of the Human Species. And as I say in the conversation, I cannot recommend this uh, highly enough. Uh, this was an absolutely tour de force, a brilliant book. And I, I loved it as I read it. And it was um, so fantastic to to talk to Rob all about it. We talked for over two hours. He was very generous uh, in giving his time and energy. And um, I was thrilled to talk to him so long about many of these uh, specifics in the book. We start by talking about the main thesis of the book, um, what it's about, why he wrote it, we talk about the two laws of ecological diversity. We talk about the increase of ecological diversity is helpful for growth. We talk about this anthropocentric view of the world. We talk about the fascinating aspects of big and small islands for diverse populations. We talk about the inadvertent arc and corridors, which is a really, really interesting concept. We talk about why humans stay concentrated in certain areas and how GDP and violence are implicated in that. We talk about what lessons we can learn um, from the natural biodiversity we see on places on the planet already. We talk about the impact of the gut microbiome, especially in utero. We talk about robot sex bees, <laughs> and we talk about the role of climate change for the future of the earth. Again, Rob has uh, such a novel thinker in some ways and is able to really think outside the box about things. Just the concept of the book alone in the beginning, he, he outlines that and it's really, really fascinating. And then all of the ways in which he builds um, his arguments and, and some of the ways in which he's viewing things is just spectacular. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's one of those books that just you read it and it sticks with you and um, you, you think about it. And I find myself thinking about some of the concepts, you know, in other conversations I have or, or other interactions. And so, uh, again, it's a, it's a brilliant book. Um, I can't recommend it highly. And uh, I'm very, very happy to bring my conversation with Rob Dunn. I'm here with Rob Dunn. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, very excited to talk with you. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Glad, glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have written a marvelous book. Uh, the book is called uh, A Natural History of the Future, what, what the Laws of Biology Tell Us About the Destiny of the Human Species. And this is not your first book. Obviously, um, we were just talking about it. You've written a book called uh, Delicious, and then you've written a few other books as well. So um, this is uh, definitely not your first rodeo. I guess just um, tell us uh, just a little bit about your background, uh, you know, kind of your, your expertise, what you study, what you write about, and then why you decided to write this book. So, so I'm trained as an ecologist and evolutionary biologist, and the the way training works in that field, especially in the U.S. but other places too, is that we're really taught to go to faraway places and study those places and how the rules of nature work in those places. So I went as a PhD student. I went to Bolivia. I went to Ecuador. I went to Costa Rica. I went to Australia, hmm. and and studied how how tropical rainforests work. You know, what what can we say about a rainforest in, in Ecuador that's also going to be true about a rainforest in Australia or Ghana. And, and I spent the first part of my career studying the sort of basic rules, but how they relate to these remote places. And mostly with a focus on insects, but I study other, other things too. And, and at some point, I got to a place where I was giving talks about this work, and I would talk to the public, and I would talk about ants or the general rules of nature, and I'd get to the end of an hour-long talk. And somebody would say... Uh, you know, Dr. Dunn, uh, what do I do about the ants in my kitchen? <laughs> and, and it used to drive me nuts because I thought, well, like, you know, here's my life work that I'm so passionate about. You know, the, 
these beautiful rules of nature, these particular species. And, and what it took me forever to realize was that that, that question was really, you know, mas- it was one question masquerading as another. Mm. And what the question really was, was, look, I listened to your boring hour long talk and the only <laughs> possible way it relates to my daily life is in the context of these ants in my kitchen. Mm. And so slowly I started to, to do the same kinds of studies that I'd used that I'd done in the rainforest in backyards and cities and in on human bodies. And so it turns out that some of the rules that work in a rainforest also work if you think about the bacteria species on your skin. And so, you know, the the number of species of bacteria in your belly button is predicted by the exact same set of rules that predicts how many trees there are in an Amazonian forest. And so I worked on this for a while and wrote about it a fair amount. And there was a there was a kind of disconnect that I was slow to appreciate. And it was a disconnect between what I and people in my field know about the living world and these rules and the decisions we're collectively making about the future. Hmm. And and the there are all kinds of versions of this disconnect. You could say, well, you know, we depend on nature, but we're destroying nature. And, and I knew that part, right? Like that wasn't news. Um, sad, but not news. Uh, but what I hadn't really uh, see, seen from the right angle, uh, and I credit Elon Musk with helping me out here, w- was that when we talk about the future, when we talk about planning human cities, when we talk about the next hundred years, we almost exclusively envision technology. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking, well, you know, where are all these things I know about the living world in these technological futures? And, and I realized there was this, this missing piece. And so the, the book really emerged as my attempt to, to come to terms with with the ways in which what we know about the living world is still going to matter regardless of how technological we become and and so it's it's an attempt to hold up those rules that understanding and hold it up against these different possible futures so we can we can do a better job of making decisions that keep the living world in mind um, because ultimately the living world does not care if we pay attention to it or not, you know, it, it will go about doing its things, B- but if we can find ways to pay more attention, find ways to keep these rules in mind, I think we can make better decisions. And so that's, that's the impetus that the book grew out of. And then, you know, I, as you probably can tell from this long winded answer, uh, <laughs> I like to think about ideas through stories. Mm. And so then the, the then the question was, well, how do you write a book like this? And it, you know, I wrote it through these stories of, you know, the discovery of these rules and then of the species to which they apply and the, the, the ways in which we're already seeing them impact our daily lives. And so I don't quite answer the question of what I should do, what you should do about the ants in your kitchen, but I get way closer to it than I ever did in the first 20 years of my career. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, the book, um, I, I kept seeing it in stores and I kept having uh, people tell me about it. Um, I have a good friend, uh, Nicole Barbero. She she has a, uh, a blog and a site where she reviews books and we read basically the same things all the time. And so we're always sharing. She's like, you got to read this. You got to read this. And I said, yeah. Sounds yeah, like a I, good friend to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll do, I'll do the same. I'll tell us show her a book. I go, you got to read this. You got to read this. And so, um, and I, and I, so I finally, I picked it up and I, and I was uh, reading it and I was, I was thinking about this, like, you know, the pitch for this had to have been so difficult, much less m- very difficult to write because there's no natural history of the future. Right. And if there is, you know, it, it kind of becomes one of these things where, you know, like if you take like, you know, in, in the fifties, what the, you know, the Jetsons thought in the future, we'd be have flying cars and stuff. And if you look at certain aspects of 2001, or if you look at other aspects of, um, you know, science fiction or fantasy, you know, we're supposed to be teleporting and, and all this, but it's always in a very futuristic technological kind of age. And I mean, obviously there's elements of that and there will continue to be that way, but it was also interesting to say, well, 
well, what is it about uh, the planet and how is it going to keep uh, evolving and co-evolving with those things um, regardless of that? And so I, I, the concept just was really novel, in my opinion. I, I really hadn't heard uh, folks talk about that. And so, you know, I think what the future, I mean, obviously, look, people have written about, you know, natural history of the planet up till now, right? Um I talked to was it Andrew Knoll, is that right? He wrote a book about the natural history of the planet. Henry G has written about this. And there's plenty of folks that have written about the natural history of the planet thus far. But in trying to think about where does that go or where could that go in the future, uh, I thought it was such a novel idea. And that's what made you know your book, I mean, it's fantastic. And that's what made it really stand out. It's like, well, what what is that? Like the world's gonna keep going regardless of what we do or don't do, although it will impact it. And what what could that be? What could that look like? And you describe a you know a series of of ways in which that could be. So you know, I think it's I think it's absolutely great. Um, early in the book, you talk about these two laws of diversity: the inventive IQ and diversity stability law. So you just tell us what those are and, and why those were important for understanding our ecological future, because the whole rest of the book kind of is uh, laid out in those in those two. Yes. So um, just like in my personal story, to a great extent, ecologists uh, collectively, we've studied faraway places. And, and and so one of those sets of places, even if they're not geographically far away from where we live, like they're at a remove from human influence, like that's been our tendency. And And so there have been thousands of studies of the rules that govern old fields. And so these, they're, they're these sort of human um, influenced grasslands in the Midwest. And there's a set of old fields in, in Minnesota that's been a particular focus. And one of the things people have studied in those old fields is what determines in a, like in a given meter by meter square, how much life you get, like how much vegetative life, for example, and how variable it is. And so the variability is measured by stability. So is it the same, you know, at time year one is in year two, if so, it's stable. And it could be stable either because it's resilient, it doesn't change. Uh, I mean, or it's, um, sorry, resistant, it doesn't change, or it's resilient, it, it changes, but bounces back. And, and when what those researchers, David Tillman in particular, were able to show, is if in one of those patches of, of uh, old field, if you had more species of plants, then that patch of, of green life was more stable through time. Mm. And, and ecologists find this really to be a beautiful rule of the living world. I mean, they're fascinated by it, have studied it in many contexts. The um, fact that more in one concentrated area allows it to flourish allows it to, to it prevents it from changing too much. And so if you mm. imagine a drought year, you know, part of what happens is even if it's a really dry year, if you have more species in that little plot, the probability that one species is able to tolerate the drought and grow back is higher. Mm. If you have a, um, an insect species that comes in and it plagues that plot, the probability that a couple of those species will be able to resist the insect goes, goes up if there are more species there. And it's, so it's a really simple rule in some ways. And it's a lot like how um, stockbrokers think about risk management. You know, so if you put a, invest a little bit in a whole bunch of different industries, if, if one industry collapses, uh, you know, you put all your money on, on uh, steam driven trains. Uh, if you had more, if you invested in other industries, the probability that one is okay uh, means your portfolio is, is more likely to, to be better. You know, it's more, don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's a mm. simple concept. Mm. But, but what hadn't been done was to bring this into the world uh, of ecosystems controlled by humans and ecosystems that matter to da daily human well-being. And so it wasn't until a couple of years ago that David Tillman, that same researcher, teamed up with Delphine uh, Renard and and did a collaboration to, to look at the world rather than a little patch of, of grass and sedges and rather than looking at all of the green life in the world they looked at uh, crops and so what was the yield of crops in countries over time if the countries planted many species of crops and had an even balance or if they planted few 
And what they found was that if countries planted many species of crops, their yield from year to year was much more stable and much better able to buffer droughts and pathogens and pests. And so here on the one hand is like, here's this beautiful little idea that we discover in an in a old field and we scale it up and it works at the, wor at the world scale. And for ecologists, like that's just really elegant. We really like that that rule works. But if we step back and think about what this means about humanity, well, it means if we want to be ready for the variability that is coming in the next years, we have to have a diversity of crops at different scales to buffer the different conditions that we're going to see. Mm. And that's important because it's exactly the opposite of what we tend to do. Yeah. And so through time, we've increasingly come to rely on fewer and fewer crops at a global scale with some interesting exceptions. And not only that, we tend to rely on one variety of each one of those crops, you know, so all bananas are the same strain. Um, you know, a huge proportion of corn is one genotype. And so in, in those cases, we're not only not buffered by having different species of crops, you know, grapes versus pineapples. We're also not buffered in that we, we don't have different varieties of the particular crops that sustain us. You, you so said on the one hand, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you you said on the on the one hand, there's few exceptions, and I'm, I am a little curious about that. Is there a way in which we've kind of stress test this, whether uh, intentionally or unintentionally? Of well, maybe there are some places where we have done that, and then what are the you would assume the hypothesis would be? You would see positive results of this, no? Yeah. yeah so that's a great question. So the. Um, What would be a good example here? So, well, so I'll work it through the other way. So, so there, if you look at what you see in a grocery store today, um, you do find in many places more things than you would have found, you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is because we have to some extent slightly buffered our global uh, system of staples. Uh, by adding a few more crops into that portfolio. And, and so we should be able to see like a global buffering from that slight addition. And then in some regions, like if you go into farmers markets in California, you'll see lots of lots of kinds of crops. And so what we would predict is if we can zoom in on particular periods of time when we planted more kinds of crops, or we can zoom in on particular states or you know, regions within countries that we should see more of that stability. Hmm. And as far as I know, nobody's looked at that yet, but th that would be the prediction. Hmm. Um, and it would be really good. I mean, th I think this is one of the other take homes. There are hundreds of people studying this phenomenon in, in old, f old fields. Th there are just two or three people studying it for global agriculture. And, and so it's a way in which like what we know about ecological systems, we've really not brought into this human uh, world, um, human centered world. And the other piece of it is, you know, to really make change in this context, it can't just be the, and this is going to be true for everything we talk about today. It can't just be the ecologist, you know, the ecologist has to be talking about talking to the ag industry, to the policymaker, to the sociologists. And, and so what I'm calling for in the book is not you know, not running a not running the world based on ecology, but instead lifting up some of these insights so that they're in conversation with these bigger dynamics. Mm. Yeah, well, of course, because it is it is um, it does all become a a question of scale and how do we scale it? And then obviously there are certain regions in the world that have I mean, there's obviously different climates and different you know uh, terrain and things like that. But then you know different populations, different types of organisms, and so each each place is going to have its own unique set of <clears throat> features and circumstances. About the the oh, I actually thought of an example. Can I can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so um, one example is when we went to Iraq uh, during the Gulf War, um, deals were signed with the new Iraqi government. And I'm going to forget all the details right now, but I can give the broad sweep that required them to buy U.S. Uh, wheat varieties and to use U.S. wheat varieties. Hmm. And um, 
after that, and so you went from a, a period where you had lots of um, styles of farming wheat and other grains, many traditional grains that didn't require much watering and where you had tons of crop diversity. I mean, one of the highest diversity places in the world for traditional grains to these these fields of um you know american varieties of, of particular kinds of wheat mm. and one of the things that that followed was a, a um a drought both in iraq and syria it was partially precipitated by what was happening in um upstream in, in some of the water systems uh in the region but also precipitated clearly by climate change mm. and Anecdotally, one of the things people talk about is the question of whether the shift toward um, farming of a reduced variety of grain types predisposed Iraq in that period uh, to being more affected by the drought, mm -hmm. um, which then uh, fed into migration from Iraq into Syria which during the extension of the drought uh, fed into unrest in Syria. And, and this all bubbles up into years of, of horrors in, in, in Syria. And so what, what is the, you know, how big is the individual piece that represents the shift in crop type there? Really hard to say, but, but that may be one of the kinds of places we can look to see, well, what happens if we, we lose that diversity, we lose that stability? Mm. Um, a less optimistic uh, way of looking at it than looking for the places where we we've increased diversity, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. also telling. Yeah, no, no, that, that is a really good example. And I, I wonder, again, obviously more work to figure this out in this area, but it'd be interesting to see either in the uh, positive or negative case, how, how that does implicate, especially if it's such a strong kind of uh, law, I guess in the terms of it being, you know, the, the human centered piece of things, you know, I, I have, um, I just kind of tee you up, I guess, for for kind of just give a give you a little runway for some overview. But the the main question I have here is is people humans we think of ourselves as special, right? Because you know we we, we can only know things through our own human lens, um, and of course there are people that are doing good research on trying to figure this out of saying well look you know um take cooperation because it's talked about a lot you know well humans aren't the only ones that cooperate you know there's you know certain types of fish and birds and other primates and other animals they they they, they have cooperation in their way so we can learn some of these things right but i guess the one thing is is that how do we and, and I forget where in the book it is, but it, there was this kind of the, the some of what I was taking away from it was how do we scale these things to show that we're just another organism on the planet? We, we're just a lot of us, right? It's almost eight eight uh, billion or whatever, but we're just another organism, and we ha we cohabitate the planet with many different multicellular and unicellular organisms on the planet that are also part of different types of life cycles, just like any other organism. So how do we understand, you know, basically where we fit in, in the play, right? Where we, we might be a main actor or we might be a central, you know, part of the central cast, but we are not the only organism on the planet. And sometimes it feels that people think of it that way. It's just this very anthropocentric kind of way of looking at things. How do we, how do we understand where we fit and where our place is on the planet juxtaposed with other organisms as we move forward uh, on the planet, you know, in the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, um, and maybe there are some biological answers and also some philosophical ones. So on the biological side, I mean, I think our perception of ourselves as distinct from other species, as separate from other species. Uh, really rests on, on the, the limitations of our visual system, you know? So we are mm -hmm. so driven by our visual system and what we see. And so you can sit in a room or you can, you can sit in a basement like I am right now and, and look around and I don't see any other species. And so it's easy to feel like I'm alone mm -hmm. but because my, my, my dominant senses are telling me I'm alone. But, 
But the reality is, you know, I am, I am inseparable from the species on my body. And if I use different senses, I, I can actually perceive that better. And so if you sit with another person in the dark and, you know, you really turn off the lights and close your eyes. And, and if you smell anything, and this is kind of a gross experiment, but there you go. All of those smells are being produced by other species. You know, every smell, almost every smell of another human being is being produced by the species that live on that human being. And, and so if we were to walk around the world primarily informed by smell, we'd be reminded all the time of all these other species around us and on us and in us. But, but our visual, visually driven bias makes it easy for us to imagine our aloneness. Um, and I think about this with Elon Musk, you know, when he flings himself up into space, he, he is still uh, full of gut microbes that he depends on for digestion. He's covered in skin microbes that if, if they were gone, he would die. And every bit of food he ingests is grown on earth, is pollinated by earth insects, uh, depends on earth microbes. And, and, you know, when he, when he goes into the bathroom in space, he has to bring that back to earth so it can be break, broken down by earth microbes. And so even in these cases, when we think we're so separate, we're connected in that way. But then the other reality is that we're, we're also just one among, you know, we don't know, a trillion species. No. Um, and, and so we walk around just imagining the this, this story just from our own perspective. And ethnographers have started to use this concept called multi-species ethnography. Mm. And it's a fancy word that, that just means telling stories from other people's perspectives or other species' perspectives, rather. And, and it's, it's useful, I think, because it reminds us that when we go outside and we sit inside, we are always in a situation when we can tell every single story that's unfolding from our own perspective or from some other species perspective. You know, what does the, the earth's history look like if you're a face mite and, and a face mite could tell that story? You know, what does it look like uh, for a bacteria species that lives that individual bacterial cell that could live thousands and thousands of years in the earth's crust? What is that story? You know, that, there are species that an individual cell, an individual of those species could, could live uh, a time period that encapsulates probably the entirety of human hist prehistory and history. Mm -hmm. And so that's also this really interesting part. So if we can accommodate the fact that each of each species is, is alive, each species has a story and that no species story is more special. The, the world gets way more interesting. But then I think, I mean, the other piece for me is at the very end of the book, I talk about what happens after humans go extinct. And humans will go extinct. You know, every mm -hmm. species does. Mm -hmm. um, if we're like the average species, we still have hundreds of thousands of years. And it's it's been fascinating to me how people respond to that last chapter. Mm. And, and, and for me, it, it, um, writing about what happens after species, humans go extinct uh, actually gave me some solace because what it reminds me of is that the processes of life continue beyond us. They're bigger than us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and they're not circumscribed by our beginning and our end. And, and some other people seem to feel the same way, but then there are other individuals for whom that, la that chapter uh, is, is horrifying. And, and that to me is really interesting. And what does that mean about our psychology? I think maybe there's some religion cooked in there too. Um, you know, plenty of our Western religions make humans very, very special, and that's hard to escape. Um, but but it's almost like we need to wake up every morning and, and remind ourselves: I'm covered in species. I'm one species among a trillion. My species will go extinct. Life will go on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I firmly agree. It was interesting when you were talking about, you know, yes, I'm, I'm also in, a, in my house and I'm in a basement and there's the species or organisms that are in me and on me, 
But it is interesting, though, to think about how for many, for much of our existence as humans on the planet, we were always interacting with other species and other organisms outside and how we live. And now we don't or, or, or it's significantly less. I mean, we would significantly less like, you know, I don't interact with, you know, bugs or birds or other animals or other things outside. Cause you know, we don't live inside, which is fine. I'm, I'm not saying people need to go and move out to a cabin in the woods and be off grid. And I'm not saying that, but it is, I think something that we start to forget if it's not within our senses all the time that we're, we are a part of, you know, a, you know, a, a trillion plus organisms on the planet. And, you know, I think it's that, so that's one thing. That's one, one, one. Yeah, and I'll just interject quickly, yeah, yeah. quickly there too, that, that I was in a, a, a committee meeting for a very smart graduate student today. And, and she's an architect. And so she's talking about architectural history. And she mentioned that in the U.S., people now spend 90% of their time indoors, 90% mm, of their yeah, living hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and she described it as a migration, that we've migrated indoors. Ah, that's a great way of, of, of conceptualizing What an interesting it. concept. Yeah, yeah. And that's a nice framing. Um, you know, what, what sort of species would do that? Um, but also that that migration is in the last 200 years. Right. Right. I mean, that's just so, you know, everything's all, you know, lightning fast now and how we, how we expand. And again, there's interesting things about this. I, I'll just say, I don't know if you've seen this on uh, on Apple plus, there's a show called home and um, it's a really cool show because it basically just, um, you know, each, each episode is a type of story. Um, and Basically, they go all around the world, and they each episode is a is a different type of home in a different part of the world, right? So there's places in the U.S. There's places in, I think, on almost all continents: Australia, Africa, Asia, Europe, um, Latin America, and it's super cool because you'll see uh, there's there's certain episodes in there um, where people will live more with nature, like they will design their house and how they live in nature. So there's this kind of hybrid way of living of they'll live, yes, inside of a house, but they're very much surrounded by the natural elements, which is a very interesting way. It's like, wow, you know, when people talk about this, it's, it feels a primordial of sorts. It's this way of like going back to our roots, so to speak, and, and how that impacts a person's psychology, how it impacts their um, their emotions, their, their mental health and, and, and just their, their physical body. Very, very interesting. And I do like that way of thinking about a migration. It's a very nice way of conceptualizing it because it does feel that way of being completely indoors. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, and again, how fast we've shifted from that. I wonder what the, I wonder what, what implications that has for humans, for us as a race, uh, or species, and then also the interactions we have and the respect we do or don't have for other organisms. I can't help but think that all, if you're distancing yourself or there's a, there's a segregation of sorts or separation, how much downstream unconsciously that impacts how we understand, you know, the, the, you know, ecology of the planet. Yeah, we, I, it's a great question or a great theme. Um, I wrote a paper a number of years ago, along with um, some colleagues, friends, really, um, called The Pigeon Paradox. And the idea we were exploring there was this, okay, we, kn we know that if, if you want people to care about conservation, they have to, to have some relationship to the natural world. And, and I'm, you can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes run natural, right? To the <laughs> living world um, in, in such a way that they, they, they know that they're experiencing the living world. But most people now live in cities and, and increasingly this will be true for the, the world. And so the challenge then becomes, well, if, if people need to be exposed to nature, to appreciate nature, but mostly live in cities... That means that the nature they need to, to be experience is urban nature. Mm. 
but we've yeah. mostly taught ourselves to dislike the species that we see in urban nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so if you think about the most common species in Boston or Man- Manhattan and New York, I mean, there are plenty of rats, there are plenty of mice, there are plenty of pigeons, there are plenty of cockroaches. And, and we've l- learned to really dislike these species. It's not innate, you know, it's a cultural relationship to these species. But those are the only ones we're seeing. Yeah. And so to go back to your, to, to your, your comments there, you know, that we wrote the paper about conservation, but I think the broader point is if we want to understand that we're part of the living world, that we're connected to the living world, that we depend on the living world, this same thing holds true. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and you, now you add to this, like the metaverse, um, <laughs> okay. r- right? Like what does the metaverse do to these relationships? If you not only are indoors, but you're inside a virtual world. Is, is there, I mean, does, does one lose all hope of a, of a cognitive connection to our, our ancestry, to our dependencies? Or is there some really creative way for the metaverse to remind us of our connections? I, I mean, I, maybe I'm just being old, but I would prefer people actually make the connections to the living world outside. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, maybe, there's, maybe the tool has, can, can lead us in, in better directions. Um, but yeah. The, yeah, I, I think I think that it's yes. I think that there's anytime you watch any types of, you know, futuristic or sci-fi films, you know, we're always having to what it means to be on the earth. I mean that we are a living multicellular organism. I think that the the one some people have said that the the evolution of of uh, humanoid AI is not going to be something we necessarily create, although we may do that as well, but it's this over time, how we make ourselves less human, less of an organism and more of a, of this type of Android kind of thing, right? Where we're putting, you know, chips and plants and, you know, we're in a, a virtual reality full time and, you know, we're further and further and further and further removed from what it means to be an organism on the planet with other, other species, you know, I don't know. Right. But people speculate yeah. these types of ways of where, where that, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's like at the, the last third of Wally where they're all sitting in chairs and they're all very large and they don't even get up to, to do anything and everything, you know, and they're living on a space station. And, you know, I mean, it's an interesting idea of years in the future, you know, you could see that path. Right. And it's like, you know, that, and again, it, it really does start to give a, the philosophical thing I think here is, well, the question becomes, what does it mean to be human, right? What is, you know, what is life and what does that mean to be human? And where does that start and where does that end? Or where does it, it, where does it change or evolve into something less or not hu- or non-human? And I think that that's an interesting thing to think about of saying, well, to be human is you're a part of, you know, the circle of life, right? They're part of different organisms here. And I, and I think that that's, um, if, we're, if we're migrating too far away from that, I think that's going to have pretty much almost overwhelmingly negative implications for us, but that could just be my, my cynical outlook. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, I, I share your outlook that the migration fully indoors is, is problematic. Um, I guess one thing, you know, one, I'm, uh, as scientists, like scientists are not good about imagining different futures. You know, we're not trained in it. Hmm. Some, some people, I mean, I don't mean to be so sweeping. Scientists are not trained to imagine different futures. And so one of the things I started to explore in this writing this book, and, and I should say with books, I mean, one of the things that happens is you, you publish the book, but the book continues because you've started these conversations. Mm-hmm. And one of the kinds of conversations I started was with speculative fiction writers. Mm. And at North Carolina State University, uh, where I work, we have an amazing writer, Cadwell Turnbull, who's a spec- speculative fiction writer. And so we've been talking about, well, what can spec- how can speculative fiction help us to think about different futures? Um, 
and it's an ongoing conversation. But one of the things that's re reminded me is that, you know, can we imagine futures in which technology, we, we in which technology enables us to reconnect with non-technology? Hmm. And, and so, you know, you've got your Fitbit, you've got your Apple watch, you've got your, whatever is signaling you with regard to whether you're doing the behavior you want to reward or not reward. But imagine we could calculate um, whether you're walking toward or away from a biodiverse ecosystem that benefits you. Hmm. Imagine we could calculate your lifetime exposure to beneficial biodiversity. Hmm. And your your little device is, is uh, you know, in, in one future imaginary, we could, you know, the device could could stab you a little if you're going the wrong direction and the other it just gives you an endorphin rush mm -hmm. when you go the right direction mm, yeah but but what could and and the thing that emerged in this conversation is well why don't we already do that mm -hmm. and the reason we don't already do it is because no species before us has ever inadvertently left behind the rest rest of life yeah and so there was no selective pressure that favored those of our ancestors that consistently rolled in mud and, and wrapped themselves in leaves and and uh, went outside mm -hmm. because there was, you know, there was no variation in that trait. And, and so we have nothing biologically that tells us to do that. You know, maybe we have some deep seated biophilia, but compared to the poles of modernity, biophilia is weak. Mm hmm. But imagine we could use technology to, to reinforce some of those things we'd like ourselves to do. What would that look like? And, yeah, I mean, I think so, it, I think yeah, that's a ahead. future we have to we have to definitely consider and say, yes, how do we, you know, not resist technology or advancements, but how do we use it to, you know, to work for us and, and how we adapt with it? And um, one of the one of the interesting things here that you bring up in the book as well is about this idea of bigger islands have more species and where extinctions and arrivals fit there you know there's this whole whole bit there i think you mentioned the work of um yale kissel who who's uh, done some work on on how organisms work on smaller and bigger islands it was funny <laughs> when i read this part it's early in the book when i read this part in the book i immediately thought of my conversation with jonathan uh, losos uh, who mm -hmm. wrote a fantastic yep. book improbable destinies on convert is the best book i've read on convergent evolution and then sure, sure enough i get to the end of the book and you you reference him a few times which was which was really nice to see so maybe we'll mention him in, in, in later but um w tell us about this idea of these islands because he's looked at it and other people have looked at it um for evolution obviously but also this idea of how bigger islands and smaller islands how what's how do organisms work here in terms of more and extinctions and arrivals and why that's so important to look at of how we can understand it for the world at large. Yeah, so this is a fascinating one to me. So that very early in ecology, ecologists started noticing that if you went from oceanic island to oceanic island, um, and this goes back even to the late 1700s, there's some hint to this, the, the bigger islands tended to have more species, more kinds of life. And so that's the first observation. This was the first sort of um, little hint of a rule. And there's a fair amount of writing early on about why that might be. And, and, and eventually, uh, an ant biologist, E.O. Wilson, mm -hmm. and a mathematician, a math mathematical ecologist, Robert MacArthur, start working on this. The story is longer and interesting. And, and come to realize that there are just a couple of sort of core processes that lead this to be the case. And so one is simply... If you have a bigger island, it's a bigger target. So if you're a bird flying over the ocean and the island is bigger, the odds that you land on the island are higher. Really simple. Hmm. And the other is, again, simple. If an island is bigger, the probability that there's uh, enough habitat for that bird to survive on the island is higher. And, and so that, you know, many, 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 many studies show this to be the case. The bigger islands have more species, they get more colonists, they have fewer extinctions. And, the, and MacArthur and Wilson wrote a book about this, Theory of Island Biogeography. And then they also, late in the book, and nobody really pays much attention to this, 
They also say the other thing that's likely happening, and they show some evidence in one little figure, is that the bigger the island, the higher the probability that a species, that once it arrives on the island, diverges from its relatives on the mainland. And so think about the Galapagos Islands here. The finches, Darwin's finches arrive in the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. On the bigger of the Galapagos Islands, the probability that they would uh, evolve around this, along a separate trajectory from the mainland increases. In addition, if the island is big enough, the Galapagos finches on the two sides of the island might also diverge from each other. And so that's in there. It's in that book, totally ignored. Uh, and in fact, when I was writing about this, every time an ecologist would, would read it, they would say, well, MacArthur and Wilson didn't say this. You need to go back and read their book. And I'm like, yes, they, they swear they did. It's just at the end, you didn't read the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> and, and so there that idea floats. And th that's where you know, Yael Kissel comes in when she was a graduate student uh, with Tim Bearclaw. Via some twists and turns, she decides to look at this idea uh, that maybe on bigger islands, the probability that two species, that one species evolves into two or three or five or eight uh, is higher. Hmm. And so she took a bunch of data sets. This is one of these projects where you, as a graduate student, you imagine you're going to study islands and you'll go to all the islands. No, she had to do this from a computer in, in the UK. But so she looks... And, and lo and behold, she finds that it is indeed the case on oceanic islands, the bigger the island, the higher the probability that a species will evolve from one species into multiple species. Mm -hmm. in, addi in addition, the less a species is able to disperse, the higher the likelihood that it evolves from one uh, into multiple. And the idea there is basically, you know, uh, What's a good example? Like, uh, imagine you're a tiger on an island and you can walk the whole island in four hours. Mm. The probability that, it, that you're going to evolve into two tiger species, one on each side of the island, is really reduced because every time the population in the east starts to evolve along one trajectory, a tiger from the west walks over, mates with a tiger to the east, and the genes are all mixed back together. And, but if you're a snail, that that same island is, is comparatively much larger because the probability that a snail goes from once the west to the east is very low. And so beautiful, beautiful study. Uh, and, and collectively, these studies then inform how we think about conservation. So we there, there was then lots of work, you know, arguing that for conservation, we need bigger areas so we can prevent extinction, so we can make sure that evolution continues. And, and, and all, of, all of these things, really elegant uh, laws of the ecological and evolutionary world. But, but what's, what had not really been pulled out here, and when I talked to Yael, Yael or talked to Tim Barraclaw, they were like, oh, yeah, this is obvious. But I, we just didn't think to say it, is that this also applies when we're thinking about the habitats that humans create and make larger and larger. The habitats that humans create and make larger and larger, turning them into ever bigger islands, are primarily our crops and our cities. Hmm. And so what that means for our daily lives, to, you know, what, what do I do about the ants in my kitchen, <laughs> is, is that the places we're actually most likely to see the evolution of new species are in our crops. And those species that are evolving in our crops are very unlikely to benefit us. They're predominantly going to be things that eat the crops mm -hmm. and, and they're in our, in our cities and in our cities, because most of our cities are pretty gray, they don't have much green space per area. Right. It's going to be mostly species that live off of us and our food. And so we've created an evolutionary scenario where this law of area predicts exactly what we're going to see. We're going to see the evolution of new crop pests and of new things that eat humans and our food. And, and that's what we're seeing. And, and so for me, this is a really um, fascinating part about working on the book is that uh, because ecologists were focusing on the far away, this thing that was really obvious to ecologists, which wasn't something they'd held up, that of course, the same principle applied to our own daily lives yields this conclusion.
And, and yet it's something that affects us all the time. And when we look around now, what we're seeing evolutionary biologists show us is that indeed when in our cities and in our farms, we're seeing extraordinarily rapid evolution. Mm. And we're even seeing things like rats in one city diverging from rats in another city. And so we're likely in the future to have New York rats and Louisiana rats and Boston rats. And in New York, uh, Jason Munchie South, one of my colleagues and friends, has actually shown that the in uh, one end of Manhattan, rats are diverging from rats in the other end of Manhattan. And for whatever reason, they're not breeding in Midtown. Midtown's just not sexy if you're a rat. <laughs> or whatever. And so this is, I mean, this is happening all around us. Yeah. And, and so then the question going back to that, you know, what, which future do we want? Well, okay, we know how to control what, you know, what sorts of things are evolving. What kinds of evolution do we want to favor? Mm. And, and I, I would speculate that very few pe people would say, well, I'd like more kinds of rats, more kinds of roaches, a different pigeon in every city. You know, that's probably not what we're going for, but that's, that, that's uh, unconsciously what we're favoring. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's a, that's that's the important question that people need to ask. That maybe just you know, it's kind of like hidden in plain sight. It's like, oh yeah, well, we've been seeing this the whole time, and it is interesting. I mean, I've been to the Galapagos Islands, and um, I went to th th three? three. I went to at least two. I think it's three. I can't remember. But the point is, is that it is interesting how different the islands are. That's not how wildly different, obviously. Right. But it is interesting how their animals are a little bit different. The terrain's a little bit different again, not wildly, but you can see, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard not to, to visit there and not think about evolution and not think about the finches and Darwin. And it is interesting when you're talking about here, right. Where it's like, you know, we're going to get the, you know, Brooklyn rats and Manhattan rats and Queens rats and, you know, just different types. And so then it's like, well, what if we, we organized, and I think there are some places in the world, certain select places where they have organized it to try and make cities that are, I think there's a term for this, you know, greener cities where you're, you're putting more plant life in cities or you're organizing buildings in a way where you could have um, more of these types of effects. And it's like, well, how do, how do we... You know as we move forward how do we design uh cities but then also how do we have you know different types of crops or how do we how do we you know curate that in a way that is going to produce you know kind of this more diversity i do want to ask about because it was it it really was super cool when i read it in the in the book you talk about the um inadvertent arc right and it was super fascinating and you talk about um you know, you talk about homing um, and, and how niches are developed, but just, you can talk about that first, I guess. And then I mean, just tell us about this inadvertent arc, what it is and, and what makes it so distinct. Um, it's, it, well, it's interesting when you write a book, like you, you coined some phrases and then forget you coined them, but I like that one. <laughs> That's my <laughs> smug showing through. Um, uh, it's in there. It's in there somewhere. That's what it is. It's the fact of the fact of like, yeah, I mean, I'll do the same thing. I'll write a piece and I'll be like, oh, I wrote that. Oh, that's not bad. It's like, yeah, but it's one of those yeah. things where it's like, oh, yeah, that did come for me. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I'm, I'm not plagiarizing myself here. I did have that idea and I have the same idea. That's good. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go ahead and have that idea again today. So the, um, <laughs> the, the inadvertent arc relates to two things. One is the niche. And so we know about the niche from economics. Now, economists stole the term from ecologists. Eco ecologists stole it from um, uh, the term used to describe the place that you put a religious figure in a building. That was the original term for a niche. But the, the niche is the set of conditions that can contain a species. And so every species has a fundamental niche. That's where it can live. And its realized niche is then where it does live. Um, and this, this is just a law of, of, of species. And it seems incredibly simple. Like this is like elementary school, you know, laws for kindergartners. Um, but it has many consequences. So one of the consequences is that every species, the, the niche of every species has thermal limits. You know, there's a maximum temperature a species can tolerate and a minimum temperature. And so one of the consequences of that law, of that aspect of the law, is that as we change climates globally, almost every species on Earth, except for lots of microbes, is going to have to move to make to keep up with where it's the 
climate conditions that correspond to its niche go. And so that's one feature of this. So think about this around you. Right now it's happening. I mean, it's happening everywhere on earth that species are moving a little bit to keep up with, with their niche. Mm -hmm. But the other piece of this is, is that in many places, species are going to have to move pretty quickly. The climate is changing faster than many species can get from here to there. And so in this context, conservation biologists came up with this idea. It's a little longer story, but the quick version is this idea of conservation corridors. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a species that lives in forest and you, you know, you, you're currently in Florida, but with climate change, you have to get up to Virginia. If we have a forest that connects Florida to Virginia, well, then it's much easier for you to move uh, and, and keep up with your, your niche to move through that corridor. And, and so my friend Nick Haddad's worked on this for years and years, mm -hmm. uh, as have many other people. And we understand it pretty well. They, you know, Nick's made these experimental corridors to track this. But, but again, the focus has been on wild places. But if we turn and we, we just step back and we say, well, much as with area, where have we already made corridors for species to move? Hmm. And... And the corridors we've made are predominantly cities, and especially cities, and to maybe a little lesser extent, agricultural areas. And so what we're already seeing is that the species that are tracking climate change the best, th that are moving to keep up with the conditions that their niche demands, are the species that live in our cities. And so mosquitoes that live in cities and bite humans and vector pathogens, they're having no trouble moving with us into the climate future we have built an inadvertent arc for them hmm. and the same is true for many of the species in cities many weeds um and conversely we've not done nearly as good a job building an arc for the species that live in forests or grasslands or swamps and you know nobody nobody set out to do this nobody said well geez i want to make a great corridor for the uh you know bed bugs but our default behavior often in retrospect is a kind of plan. And that's one of the things like throughout the book, the people, you know, there's a tendency to say, well, you know, we don't know everything yet. How can we, we make some of these bolder plans? And I think the thing to remember is every one of our actions is a plan, whether we mean it to be or not, you know, and so the ways we've built our cities is a plan for which species will move with climate change. Mm. It's, it is just a plan that inadvertently favors the species we don't like. Mm. Yeah, you, you talk about it's interesting. I, I, I you know, I, I have to say, I, I, if you haven't read the book, I mean, you absolutely should. There was parts of your book where I could see these traces of because um, I kept thinking about it throughout was um, the book by Jeffrey West called Scale. I mean, you've had to have read it. I mean, it's a, it's a, I have, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, and I, he talks about, you know, fractals and all these things. And it's really interesting about scale. Scale is a, also a question I've become sort of obsessed with um, in the past couple of years. And it, he talks all about it. It's really interesting. And it's this piece on the corridor and on the, this inadvertent arc, which is, which is fascinating. Um, Cause you, you talk about that. We have, you know, corridors, um, you know, such as, connecting wild habitats from Yellowstone all the way up to the Yukon Territory in Canada. Um, obviously, the Appalachian Trail, which is, uh, I live in the, the northern part of that. And, and, then, and then how we do that in, in cities and urbanization, such as from, you know, basically DC to, 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 uh, to New York City. But then we're, we, there is, as you're saying, like if you have certain types of mosquitoes, well, then there's a, it's almost like a, like a canopy or, and, or an arc where it's just, they're kind of moving in that way. And so it becomes, again, this whole thing of if we're doing these things, you know, we're creating certain environments or cities or, or how we're building things, how do we, how do we, how do we do it in a way that's uh, more open or more thoughtful? into not restricting only a couple types of you know species or certain types of organisms and how do we expand that outward to have you know more diversity there yeah and and, and i guess i would say too that, um i mean i talk as you might imagine i talk about this stuff a fair amount to students and and, and sometimes i think 
Um, I think today's students are amazing. It is an amazing group of young humans at universities uh, who will do great things in the world. And so, so I find them very, um, they inspire optimism. But nonetheless, those students, you know, are very aware of the challenges we face, by and large. And, and so sometimes I'll get a question in a talk about, well, you know, this is all so much. Like, you know, can we really do any of this? And, and one of the things I feel very strongly about is that for any of these things that we're talking about t today, Xavier, that we don't have to solve the global version as individuals. Mm. You know, if we can create examples of how to do these things, as humans, we're, we're really good at copying examples. Yeah. And, and, and so there, I think, you know, we have some wild corridors that have been very successful. Mm -hmm. We have those examples. And so we can think about how do you do these in different places? Earlier, you're talking about green cities. We're starting to see examples of real innovation and in urban planning. And we could be bolder. But if, but if you're an urban planner, you don't have to do urban, you don't have to urban plan the whole world. But if you can transform, transform Hamburg, for example, mm -hmm. you know, then other people can see that example. And so seeing those examples of what it would look like to be visionary, I think is so important. And, and I think much more accessible, you know, for people in these fields. And I'll just as a little parenthetical, one of my previous books, Never Home Alone, was all about this migration indoors and the species that we live with. And in it, at the end of the book, I was really looking for architects and urban planners who were doing visionary things with regard to the life around us. And mm -hmm. I just wasn't finding, I mean, or not. And, and so I took a jab, at a gentle jab at architects and, lands and uh, landscape architects and urban planners at the end of the book. And, and bless their hearts, w w rather than um, send me nasty letters with what architects and urban planners have largely, well, a subset have done is to reach out and say, hey, I want to do something visionary here. What do we do? How do we mm. team? Wow. Wow. Very nice. And, yeah. and I think that's really hopeful. And so I think there are just a lot of people who'd like to make these kinds of changes. And so I, I think we can do it. And, and the, it, it strikes me in the corridor context. It seems like such a big thing. How do you make a whole landscape level corridor but we have examples we you know people have done it we can do it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is possible yeah yeah no i i i absolutely agree the uh the, the one big piece here that you you mentioned which was also super fascinating you talk about the fundamental and the realized niche but you you also talk about the human niche which is this idea that um humans have continued to, to stay more concentrated in certain climates that they live in and not necessarily spread out more evenly on the planet uh, i think I, I think i have that right now obviously we're all over the planet <laughs> but you mentioned that gdp and violence are two factors behind this so maybe just kind of uh, tell us what you mean there and then why the, you you use those two uh factors that are kind of pushing that yeah, so this is, you know, obviously a pretty important thing for thinking about humanity moving forward. And there's a, um, I pause to collect myself a little bit. So if we talk about butterflies, we know a lot about the niches of particular butterfly species and, and where those butterflies are likely to move in the future as climate changes. And what conditions benefit the butterflies? We, we know far less about what conditions uh, humans require and what conditions benefit humans at a global scale. But we're starting to see uh, evidence from different fields of the ways in which different temperatures, different levels of humidity influence human thriving. And so we can measure human thriving different ways. So one way is GDP, you know, it's super capitalist, obviously does not encapsulate everything we want out of humanity, but it nonetheless contains information. So there's a, a group based partially at Berkeley that's looked at the gross domestic product of different countries through time uh, as a function of year to year changes in temperature. Mm. And, and what they're able to show is that in years 
um, if you're in a cold country, if the mean annual temperature of your country is below 13 degrees centigrade. So Norway or Norway, Iceland, Iceland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in a good, in a warmer year, the GDP, there's a little bit of a lag but increases. Mm. And, and so you're in that cold space, a warmer year, your crops do better. It's easier to work outside. But conversely, above 13 degrees C, in a warmer year, the G- GDP of countries rather consistently decreases. Hmm. And, and the analysis here is complex, but the take-homes are pretty simple. And, and what, what this group's been able to do, and Solomon Sang is uh, one of the people who did this work, Marshall Burke, is that by focusing on countries and change through time, they get rid of all that complex human stuff that makes these analyses hard. So, you know, they're controlling for culture. They're controlling for affluence. And, and so there's this really consistent effect on GDP. And, and this becomes, a, a, and so you could say, well, there's some economic niche space there. Like if when you get above 13 degrees, somehow it becomes a little bit more difficult to maintain an economy. And, one of, and so we're now writing another a paper that builds on some of these ideas. And just today, we're trying to figure out, well, how do you think about this? And so one part of this is that, um, and I'll explain another concept here quickly, the wet bulb temperature. So wet bulb temperature is, is you know, when, when the, the weather people give you that feels like temperature, you know, it's 85 out, but 90% humidity feels like 105. That's kind of like wet bulb temperature. And why wet bulb temperature matters is uh, human heat is actually harder to deal with for humans because the closer the um, if it's humid, the hotter it gets, the harder it is for us to sweat and to cool ourselves. Hmm. And so wet bulb temperature is this pretty direct measure of, you know, is it too hot? And so if you look at countries above 13 degrees mean annual temperature, for every degree above 13 you go, the more days you have that where the wet bulb temperature is too hot to work all day. And so it's not that the mean is too hot. It's just that you're getting more and more of those days. And, and so more and more of those days when you can't work outside, more and more of those days where if you do work outside, you're not happy, you might be getting sick. Um, in some places, more of those days that would actually kill you. And, and so that's one piece of this puzzle. Separately, psychologists have started studying this phenomenon, and, and they've identified independently a pretty similar temperature where they start to see uh, increased violence. And so this mm-hmm. is all kinds of violence. It's mm-hmm. suicide. It's uh, sort of self-harm. It's uh, people beating each other up at a baseball game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's every kind of horrible violence you, you can imagine. Yeah. also tend to increase with temperature. Mm-hmm. But there seem to be some caveats we could come back to later. But so, And so you can imagine these things are they're part of a whole. You know, it gets hotter. It's harder to do work. The probability of violence goes up. Um, the amount of work that happens in a country goes down. And then on top of that, at those same temperatures that humans start to really struggle, a lot of our crops start to struggle. And, and so you get these things all coming together. And, and so as a result of all these things, if you look globally at where humans have achieved high population densities, for the last 6,000 years, it's actually pretty circumscribed. You know, we, some people live almost everywhere, but high densities of people really only exist in a, in a narrower subset of conditions. And where that's a problem, bringing this all back around to the niche question, it is that those conditions where humans thrive at high population densities uh, are shrinking mm. with climate change. And, and, and so in the, in the, there's early evidence that in the places that are on these margins, so at the border of uh, conditions humans can easily thrive in and those where humans can't, that we're also seeing more violence, we're also seeing more political strife. And so this then becomes a, a big issue because it it will likely entail migration of many many people, hmm. and mostly these are people 
in hot countries that have had almost nothing to do with climate change who are being forced to move by the actions of people in cold, affluent countries like mm. the U.S., like Europe, increasingly like China, where most of the emissions comes from. And so for me, then, the, the big question, well, geez, there's so many big questions here. And this is one where I don't, <laughs> I don't have a pithy answer for the students. Um, is, you know, A, how do we reduce our emissions as much as we can and get to zero as fast as we can? But B, how do we think holistically at a global scale about what it's going to take to help all of these people thrive that are now in places that are becoming too hot to live in the ways that we currently know how to live? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think those... Yeah, those are, I mean, those are the, the right, the big questions that people are trying to figure out. And I think it's, I think it is, it, it's, it's, it's kind of become, it's been a more of like an abstract question, but as you're saying, with more migration and with more temperatures and emissions, these things start to become more uh, in the forefront. And we're now having to face it, you know, right now and say, oh, how do we, how do we figure this out? We can't just wait, you know, five or 10 years to, uh, to figure this out. So I guess moving from, you know, kind of the, the human niche and how we, you know, have these different ways in which we're concentrated, I guess the, the one thing I want to know or want to talk about is this idea of, you mentioned earlier, and I was going to ask about it, but you talk about um, diversity, stability hypothesis and the portfolio effect and how competition is key for increasing more biodiversity on the planet. And so we've been talking about this in different ways, I think, but I'm wondering, there's a, a handful of biodiverse places on the, on the planet, such as the Amazon in many parts of South America. And so I'm wondering what can we learn from places that already have a lot of biodiversity for trying to scale it upwards and, and, and other places that may have less at the moment. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, maybe the, the, there are a couple of versions of that question. I mean, so, so one I think relates to how those diverse ecosystems work and the ways we already benefit from them. Mm. And so, if we think about aquifers, you know, so uh, where, where are you geographically? So I'm up here in Western Maryland, just in the one of the seat of, of Appalachia, kind of North Appalachia. Yeah, so I mean, so you've got some amazing old aquifers there. That if if you're drinking well water, you're depending on the biodiversity of those aquifers. Basically, process um, the, the water, remove toxins, or some of the toxins, uh, and also kill off pathogens hmm. and, and and so that biodiverse ecosystem allows people to drink well water and in places where we've not screwed up the aquifer even big cities rely primarily on the aquifer to keep the water clean and you can't see it but i'm cleans in air quotes because it's you know suitable for the service right it's it's uh clean in that it doesn't, it's not loaded with pathogens that are going to make you sick. And so Vienna and Austria, for example, largely just re relies on that biodiverse ecosystem uh, around Vienna for drinking water. Copenhagen used to do the same. They've actually started chlorinating. And, and so that's a case where, you know, one of the things that we can learn from studying those biodiverse ecosystems, and we actually don't understand those underground aquifers hardly at all and how they work. I mean, um, I mean we're really, uh, I mean, these are the first years of our understanding in some ways of those systems. But if we can understand how those work, we can understand better how not to screw them up, mm. how, to, how to preserve their benefits. But then the other piece is that when when we screw up those biodiverse ecosystems, often the only choice we have is to try to recreate them the best we can. And, and we're typically, um, when we recreate natural ecosystems, we often, we, we uh, laud ourselves and give out awards, but we typically <laughs> create versions that are not as good as the original. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're often super necessary. And so the aquifer here is a good example that, 
you know, if you think about, um, well, many major cities in the U.S. either no longer have a big enough aquifer to rely on, or they've polluted it, so they need to treat it in in, in other ways. And, and so once you get to that situation, well, you don't have many options. So you have to somehow um, replace the services of, provided by the biodiverse ecosystem with services that are engineered. Hmm. And, you know, if I'm on the pod, you know, if I'm focusing on the optimistic side or the, um, you know, progressivist side, I would say like, it is amazing what we've done in this regard, you know, with chlorination of some of these water, uh, polluted water supplies has been amazing in preventing disease. Hmm. You know, when you screw up the water system, you have a polluted water supply, too much human feces, uh, chlorination with, along with some filtration, it's, it saves millions and millions of lives. A huge, a huge deal. Hmm. Um, so major success in, in, in the sort of progressivist view. But at the same time, it's also very clear that what we've created with those water treatment systems is not as good as what the aquifer does hmm. with regard to microorganisms. And so one of the ways we see this is if you look in, we've studied uh, shower heads, which it's one of these many sort of funny niche things that my co collaborators and I have studied that seems obscure, but becomes um, more relevant as you examine it. Hmm. And so in shower heads, if you have an American style shower head, you unscrew the shower head and you look inside, there's often some gunk in there. And that gunk is biofilm. Biofilm is this extraordinary sort of apartment complex that microbes build collaboratively across species for themselves in, in order to present, prevent themselves from being washed away. And it's always there. Uh, there's always, there are always microbes in your tap water. There's, there are microbes in your bottled water. It's fine. But, but, but sometimes in, in those shower heads, we see non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which if if you're healthy are not a problem, but if you're immunocompromised, uh, can be, can be life-threatening. Hmm. And so one of the questions were, why are they there sometimes and not other times? And it looks as though our work has shown that part of the story is chlorination, that the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which are not very good competitors, are pretty chlorine tolerant. And so when we chlorinate, we kill off a lot of other species, but we leave the non-tuberculous mycobacteria and they become a larger proportion of that biofilm. And, and so nonetheless, it's the case that we, you know, what we've created with chlorination and water treatment is much better than, than the broken system we had after we screwed up the natural system. I mean, it's, it's amazing, saving many, many lives, but it does not yet approximate the natural system. And so to go back to your question, one of the things we can do is to figure out, well, are there more elements of the natural system that we can bring back into the engineered system to make mm -hmm. it a little bit more like that biodiverse version of the ecosystem? And, and so one of the things you could do is, well, what if you introduce into the water system after chlorination some harmless microbes that can compete with the non-tuberculous mycobacteria? And, and I don't know if anybody's tried that, but that's the kind of line of thinking you might imagine going down. And so that's... That's one route, um, but th but the other route is that, in my experience, almost any time we study a biodiverse ecosystem, that we find features of the the living world that we didn't understand existed, mm. and and so if we think about the inadvertent arc that I introduced earlier, you introduced earlier, and the you know the, the arc that we should work on. We need to preserve the species that benefit us now, but also the species that might someday benefit us. And those biodiverse ecosystems are full of those species that might someday benefit us. Hmm. The only way we find them is by studying those places. Hmm. And, and really, the science of, of discovering the uses of biodiverse ecosystems it hasn't started. I mean, we're so early in it. I mean, I'll ring a bell when we begin because the, it is not, <laughs> we're not there yet. And, and just to give you a simple example, uh, a number of years ago, uh, a colleague of mine who does science engagement now works for the, the Moorhead, um, now works for the Marbles, a kids museum in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, 
he came to me and said, you know, we want to make a special beer for an event. Can you find a unique yeast in your lab or in your studies that we could use to try to make a beer? And he'd partner with a, a brewer, John Shepard. And so we, we thought about it for a while. And at the time, there was somebody in my lab, Ann Madden, who studied wasps, a paper wasp. These wasps that make a big paper nest. It's a beautiful nest. Mm -hmm. uh, characteristically, humans knock them down. The wasps all fly out and sting them. And it gets on Funniest Home videos. <laughs> and, and so Ann said, well, we should try the wasps because her studies of these wasps in nature had shown that they often have unusual yeasts in their guts. The very first individual wasp Anne studied, one wasp from a big colony, had a, a new kind of yeast that could make a sour beer in a month rather than years. Wow. And uh, that's now a license. There's a company that's making beers using that yeast that um, Anne and John continue to work on this. And that's from one wasp, one individual wasp. Uh, well, if we think about insects in general, you know, we think that there are probably at least 10 million insect and other arthropod species. One wasp has this thing that could revolutionize what we do with beer. What does the second wasp have? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What does the thousandth wasp have? And, and we've worked in my lab a little bit trying to figure out how do we predict which species are more likely targets. But we've really only started. And the... Just last thing, like this last thing here, but the, the there's a, a pharmaceutical company, Merck, that decided to try a big project in Costa Rica a number of years ago to bioprospect, which is what this is often called, uh, to find new uh, miracle cures. And, and I would say they were sort of partially successful, but not so successful that they didn't close down their the Costa Rican operation. But what they did was to look for things that would make tons of money. And so they looked for cancer drugs. And they screened nature randomly. And, and I think what we really need is a much broader endeavor to look for all kinds of solutions, some of which might make money, some of which don't, um, and that, that appeal to the many needs of humanity. And, and we I mean, frankly, we don't have a big initiative like that anywhere in the world. And so if, if you're a young student thinking about the future, that door is open. Yeah, I mean, there's so much potential. And I think that, you know, I think you're right. I mean, we, we haven't even scratched the surface. Um, I definitely want to, you bring up wasps, which is interesting. I, I definitely, you, you mentioned bees in the book, which I, I definitely want to come to. Um, before we jump there, I'm, I'm still on this. We talked about it earlier and I, I'm still interested in this because uh, it will tie into something you mentioned in the book, which is also super fascinating. So, you know, we said earlier and you say in the book, there's there's really no boundary between us as humans and, and nature, which I, which I fully agree with. And you talk about that there's this essential value of, of microbes for our lives. And now some people may say like, well, maybe, maybe we're the parasite and not the host, right? We're, we're, and, and that's a cynical view, but it does seem to, when you understand certain things about the human body and, and our interactions with the environment, it does, it's an, you can have, you can look at this from different perspectives and you mentioned in the in the book the work by uh maria gloria dominguez uh, bello and maybe you could talk about some of her research i mean obviously you don't have to speak for her but she's done some really interesting research on uh, bacteria um hudson's microbes in utero uh, just talk about kind of her work and the implications that it has on understanding the law of dependence that humans have with nature yeah, so she's really done amazing work. And she started off doing, uh, I tell the story more length in the book, I'll tell a quick version here, studying Quatsines, which are these crazy birds that um, they have a crazy mo. I mean, you should Google Quatsine. Mm -hmm. um, but they often live over these uh, black swamps. And, um, and so she was interested in figuring out where these birds get their key microbes from. And one of the things she observed is that the birds get some of their microbes uh, from their parents and from their mothers in particular. And so they were vertically inheriting, is what we, we call it, some of their microbes. You know, the microbes are being passed on. Like if you looked at a genealogy of the Watsinas and, and you looked at a genealogy of their microbes, they would kind of match. 
um, almost as if they were being inherited like genes and not quite that clean, but that was the idea. And via a number of twists and, and, and turns, Maria became interested not just in this uh, wild bird version of this story. And, and I, sh I should say it's important that the birds acquire these microbes because they need them for digestion, mm -hmm. they need them for immune health. And, and, and so, you know, they've gone on inquiring them like this for, for years and years. And at the time that Marie was doing this work, other people already knew that this was the case for termites. And so many termites and their microbes are mutually unculturable. We don't know how to grow the termites without their microbes, and we don't know how to grow many of the microbes without the termites. And termite uh, queens and kings, actually, when they make a new colony, they carry these microbes with them, and they vertically pass along these key microbes. And, and so uh, Maria became interested in, well, how, how does this happen in humans? <laughs> and we've known since the late 1800s, early 1900s, that babies acquire key microbes that they need for digestion, for skin health. And so it's not entirely new, but the process just wasn't super clear. And, and, and so Domingos Bayo would go on to, to study this in humans, um, first with a, with a study in the tropics and later with other studies. And what she was able to show is that many of the microbes that human newborn babies acquire are coming from their mothers during birth. And to varying extents, they're their mother's vaginal microbes and their mother's fecal microbes being passed on during birth. Hmm. And, and so here's this amazing process wherein mom gives you half of your genes, but most of your microbes. And so right now, as you're listening and thinking about your own digestion, your own skin microbes, your own bodily health, it's this amazing reality that not only did you get the half of your genes from mom, but you got thousands of bacteria species from mom. Mm -hmm. And so this on its own is, is super interesting. And there were going to be many studies and the, you know, the, the follow-up studies would refine the details of our understanding. But the other thing that would, would become clear is that if we look back in evolutionary time, is that this, is, this has gone on for millions and millions of years. And we, we, had, we did a study on chimpanzees where we were able to show that, that um, different chimp populations have different gut microbiomes. And this appears to be because they're inheriting them from moms and, and they're sort of this in the same way that genes evolve, that different populations are evolving divergently in terms of their gut microbes. It's, but this is for millions and millions of years until we introduced C-sections. Mm. These sections were introduced uh, because they saved lives, super, super important in many cases. Many yeah. mothers have been saved by the extraordinary medical uh, invention, intervention. Um, now they're a mix of, of, uh, necessity, like necessary C-sections and, mm -hmm. um, sort of volitional C-sections, but C-sections without us knowing it, were a kind of microbial experiment because during C-sections, the baby doesn't, uh, pass vaginally, mm -hmm. approved, um, without any of that context. And contact and and so subsequent studies would show that that c-section babies are sometimes acquiring the useful the right gut microbes and skin microbes but that very often they're not that they're getting colonized instead by hospital microbes and that that has health consequences later in life and so just to be clear, this is this is obviously not the case that this is happening with every C-section necessarily, correct? This is no, on no, average. It's, it's a little bit uh, what we would say stochastic. So chancy. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if um, so when acquiring gut microbes in particular, one of the key things is that when you're older, so like for both for you and for me, our stomachs are very acidic. And so it is hard to acquire new gut microbes because when they go through the stomach, they're killed. Mm -hmm. 
during the first couple of years in life, the stomach is not acidic. It's initially neutral and then becomes slowly more acidic. And so there's a window when those babies can still acquire gut microbes. And so relatively often, they acquire them from somewhere else in the environment. They find, some, they find again in air quotes, fecal microbes in the soil. They pick up dog gut microbes. They inadvertently pick up human gut microbes from around their environment. And they pick up enough of them that their gut is colonized by most of what they need. And, and so some C-section babies totally healthy with regard to their gut microbiomes. Uh, in some cases, that's because they actually have dog gut microbes. Mm. They pick them up from the family dog that has been kind of a rescue, uh, a microbial rescue in some, in some real way. And mm. then in other cases, babies just never acquire um, those gut microbes. And in those cases, we see a, a suite of immune and sort of gut dysbiosis problems that can linger into later life. And, and so it's a really complex story because what does it then mean that you should do? Because some, sometimes we absolutely need C-sections um, very often. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, I'll tell you what microbiologists do, which is that microbiologists very often store their own feces in the refrigerator or mm -hmm. freezer rather. Um, and so, you know, if you're poking around a microbiologist freezer, do so with care. <laughs> and and they, they do so because if, if they're having kids and, and they think, you know, they might have a C-section that they want to have some feces on hand to colonize their, their baby's gut after birth. Hmm. And, and so to me here, there, there are two stories, one of which is, is the extent to which um, we have depended on a process for millions of years without realizing it. You know, no chimpanzee yeah. knows like, oh, I just got mom's microbes. I'm so grateful <laughs> for the, the process of, of birth and all its intricacies. But mm -hmm. it just happened. Yeah. Um, and so to me, that's, that's one. Here is this connection, this deep connection to ancestry. Um, but the other piece here is that we can't go backward, you know, we are where we are. And so given where we are in our story, how do we reconnect people with, you know, we make sure newborns are acquiring these microbes. And in my experience, in the medicalized version of all of this, what, what is almost certainly going to happen is that microbes will be commercialized uh, and, and, C-section babies will be dosed with key microbes at, at birth mm. in order to ensure that they're colonized by those key microbes. Mm. Um, you know, even though those microbes are free in nature, they will be eventually very expensive, uh, at least in the American system. Mm. Uh, but it will also be really complex because you don't need two microbe species for your gut microbiome to work. You need hundreds, often yeah. thousands. Mm. And, and it's a little bit like the difficulty of figuring out what's, what's the best food to eat. Mm -hmm. It's a big kind of question. Mm. Um, but there are other, um, if, um, Xavier, if I can go on just a little bit here, there's yeah, I mean, yeah. another, uh, something that emerged after the book was finished. And this is the, you know, the, the pain in the ass about science. It keeps unfolding. <laughs> uh, is that um, Justin Sonnenberg and his group at Stanford have been able to show that some of the of the metabolites, some of the chemicals that microbes produce in the gut, are these really strong signals to the body that, that help to keep it healthy. Hmm. And so one of those, two of those signals are acetic acid and lactic acid. Mm -hmm. And acetic acid comes from things like vinegar, fermented foods that are made using acetic acid bacteria. And lactic acid comes from things like yogurt, kombucha, um, some kinds of beers. And that those two compounds, even if you kill the microbes that make them. So if you take a like take sauerkraut, which is full of lactic acid bacteria, kill all the microbes in the sauerkraut, but leave the lactic acid and feed it to someone, that it calms their immune system down, hmm. improves gut health, and helps to promote biodiversity in the gut. And so I think one of the, and so this is basically an ecological trick that, that, you know, how do we, 
we convince the the gut that we have the right microbes there and tell it to calm down and stop overreacting. And it looks like this may be one of the ways we can um, kind of hack the gut using some ecological ideas. The super cool question is, why does the gut respond to lactic acid? And the the answer appears to be that about 8 million years ago, our ancestors were eating enough fermented fruit that it was sufficient to trigger evolutionary changes in our bodies. Mm. That lactic acid receptor that responds to that lactic, lactic acid evolved then. And so, you know, on the one hand, you have uh, Maria Domingos Bayo's amazing work showing how we acquire our microbes, our interdependence with these microbes, our need for having ways to pass them on. On the other hand, this lactic acid work is showing little quirks of our evolutionary history totally shape which microbes we need and benefit us. And, and, and so all this is going on at the same time. And if you're, if you're an ecologist, it's really beautiful. If you're a doctor, it's, it's, it's a headache. Problematic it's a he headache. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very difficult. And also I, I, I should probably know here. It's interesting what you're saying about the lactic acid. You know, I have to think that, um, you know, I, this is totally a tangent, so I don't want to go down it, but <laughs> You know, it's 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 the, the types of food that we have in the United States, as opposed to other parts of the world, is significantly different um, in some ways. Um, and I would say that food in other parts of the world um, is usually, you know, maybe cleaner or healthier, or um, it's more local. There's less, you know, stuff in it, and and so that's not to say that there isn't healthy food in the United States, but it is. There, there is somewhat of a difference here. So I, I also wonder, you know, it's, you know, people have, uh, I mean, I'm not promoting it per se, but people have gone on and on and on about, you know, the Mediterranean diet and the types of food they eat and et cetera. And of course there's downsides to that. And of course it also depends on each person's individual biology, et cetera. But it is curious though, to understand that as we understand more things about our gut microbiome and then what that's like for, you know, each individual in different, uh, regions, you know, what implications does that have for continuing to evolve? some of the kind of quote unquote standards for um, nutrition and, and things of that nature. So it's just interesting to see all of these things kind of coalescing together. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you sort of three quick anecdotes there. So, mm -hmm. so one is I would say from a dietary perspective, I mean, we're increasingly understanding that there are lots of kinds of healthy diets that work pretty mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, globally, we're, we're moving toward the one diet we acknowledge is terrible. You know, so, it's, it's so, you know, we're now in a point where it's like, we don't have to necessarily find the perfect thing. We just have to not screw up and, and continue to do the worst thing. Mm -hmm. And, but, but that's an interplay. So the second story is that that's an interplay with the microbes. And so we, we now know very clearly like that, the some microbes are obesogenic. So some gut microbiomes um, tend to cause obesity, predispose people to diabetes and we can see this in rats, which are not humans, but are a lot like humans. Um, and, and so if, if you take a rat um, with an obesogenic microbiome and you put, well, let's, let's say, let's say it this way. You take a microbiome from a, 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 an obese rat and a microbiome from a skinny rat, mm. all things equal, and you give them both to identical twin rats the rats are identical they're going to get the same food sources and they just get the 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 fat rat microbes or the skinny rat microbes the the rat that gets the fat rat microbes quickly gains weight regardless of whether or not it's given the same food as the other mouse with other rat rather and so which microbiome you have influences how you respond even if you don't change the diet mm. and and so we've known that for a while and, um, and what, you know, where that becomes really interesting and problematic is that we're seeing, you know, in Western countries in general, we're losing a bunch of microbes we used to have. And, and in many cases, we're converging on that fat rat microbiome rather than microbiomes that would be more likely to give us benefits. The other piece of this story that's just come out in the last couple of years 
is it used to be thought that what's going on in the gut doesn't really affect the brain very much. You know, things don't cross the blood brain barrier separate. It's, it's now clear that which microbes you have and how you feed them affects brain and behavior hmm. and can lead to fundamental changes in things as, as important as personality. And there's recent studies showing that in um, rats that exhibit bipolar behavior and in normal rats, if, if you switch their microbes, you can switch those behaviors. Hmm. And, and so, which is not to say that those microbes are causing, you know, bipolar disorder in humans, but, but that the effects of the microbes can be so great on the brain so as to trigger bipolar-like behaviors or to, to um, send them into remission, in essence. And so, the if you think of it like, well, wh what is the thing that most makes us individuals? What is the thing that most separates us from everything else? You know, what is the... You know, uh, sure, we can tell people that um, they're connected to the rest of nature, but this idea that, yeah, but, but I'm still myself. Mm. But if, you ch if, if I change your microbiome and it changes your behavior in a fundamental way, does yourself even exist in the way that you think it exists? Well, I mean, that, that's the, the wild uh, intersection there of some of the philosophical stuff, right? You know, I, I'm not entirely convinced that we have a self. I think it's mostly an illusion. I think people work on that and uh, illusions are good in some ways, I think, because it's such as things like that or free will or things like that. But it's one of those things where, you know, really it's we're <clears throat> a composite of all of our experiences, right? There's no self that's riding in the the you know the car or whatever is a passenger inside of us right all of the things are ourselves so if you take this all the way down to the body it's the same thing right how our body is is super important right how how we're doing or changing things is all connected to how we identify how we are as a self and so if somebody is or is not making certain changes to various parts of our biology you know, how does that, how does that, again, right? Where does who you are, whatever that is, you know, uh, start and end, right? You know, how does that say, okay, well now you've changed this too much or, you know, this is, you know, or you shouldn't have done this too far or things like that. And I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting about, again, kind of the future of, of, you know, how do we, how do we examine these things, right? This is, I think, where the also the ethics comes in as well. You know, how much should we interact with this stuff? I mean, we're, with, we're within years, and, and maybe they're already about to be out there. I've not checked the patents recently. In the, um, but it will be very soon when you can buy a pill with a specific microbe mm -hmm. that affects your behavior, your sense of well-being. That's, I mean, that's coming. That is very, very soon. Yeah, and that's... I mean, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm resistant to that, not because I'm a stick in the mud or something, or I just want to stay, you know, but I, I think it's, it's interesting. The things I read, the conversations I have, the more and more I'm convinced that we should do change, uh, not too slow, but definitely not too fast. We, we don't like that as a society, as individuals. Uh, some things have been on a backlog, so we do have to change those because we've been needing to do it for, you know, for, you know, centuries or decades. But I think there are other things. Um, you know, I think technology is too fast sometimes. We're trying to catch up with our standards and regulation and ethics and morals. I think certain things in, in um, uh, medicine or in the social sciences, we also need to pump the brakes on some things. And so, you know, but there's other things where some maybe more social issues where it's like, we've been needing to do this for decades or, you know, centuries. So I, I do, I totally agree. I think that that is down the line five, 10 years from now. And I think we have to have treat that with a lot of care before we just start, you know, handing that out or whatever. So, um, I do want to. It's a lot like the wa the water treatment, right? That yeah, yeah. You know, you know we have a working system, and and uh, you know n now we're going to hack it to to carry out one of these mm -hmm. services we know we want. Like, um, you know, can we can we add a microbe that benefits our mental health? Mm -hmm. um, 
but the odds that we know enough to, to make it work as well as the ancient version worked are, are pretty low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to just ask real, real quick is because I'm interested in this. Um, uh, just, just real quick. And then we'll, we'll, uh, I, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? We, we've, we talked about, you know, uh, uh, this, all these ecological things and we haven't even brought up directly climate change. Uh, which is interesting. <laughs> um, but I do want to ask real quick, uh, you talk about robot sex bees, which is fascinating. Um, and I don't know, have you, have you read, uh, Lars, uh, Chitka's, uh, book, the mind of a bee? It's, uh, it's, it's new. It's, or it's newer. Oh, I've, I've not read it yet. Yeah. I, I, I've read it. Uh, I'm talking to him, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask him everything about bees. <laughs> um, but you talk about some of these, and I've heard about this as well, these AI bees, right? And how they, you know, they're a lot of potential and there's, we need them because bees are dying and they're not pollinating as much. You know, what, what do you think about AI bees and from what we know about researchers that have studied about bees that this could be helpful, this could be harmful, a mix of both for our future of, of having these kind of artificial bees? You know, I, um, well, I guess I go back to your comment about free will, you know, like, the, <laughs> so, like, uh, I'm not sure how much I believe in free will, but it sure is easier waking up thinking I have it. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, you know, my gut reaction to the bees is, you know, we have natural ecosystems with wild bee species that that can successfully pollinate everything we need to pollinate if we don't screw up their populations. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we've taken a domesticated bee or a partially domesticated bee, the honeybee, spread it around the world in order to perform this service. You know, honey honeybees are sort of like living robots. Um, uh, you know, and so some in some ways there are honeybees are our first round of sex robot experimentation. Uh, pollinator sex robot experimentation and and then on top of that we now have this new layer of can we imagine a technology and we could sort of posit different versions so let's posit something that looks like a, a bee that, that uses ai to find flowers to pollinate those flowers and to do it with maximal efficiency and and is the ecologist, I, I think my my first reaction is is to to say that well we have working systems. Our first job is to to save those ecosystems where we're screwing them up, um, to do a better job of shepherding our honeybees, which which are you know in many places are in places are an introduced species, but they do this service for us. Um, they also provide honey, which is pretty nice, uh, and, and it. And in some ways, like what's happening to honeybees is mysterious, but really it's not. You know, we we uh, put them in places where they're sprayed with pesticide all the time. We put them in places where their microbes that they need to ferment their pollen are sprayed with fungicide. Every year we bring them together in a, in a massive collection in California to pollinate trees and diseases spread among. I mean, and, and they're not that genetically diverse in many sense. And so... It seems like our first job is to do just a slightly better job of conserving native bees, a slightly better job of, of shepherding our uh, our honeybees. But if I think about the you know the far future, um, and we have all kinds of farms in the far future, some of them are indoors. You know, could we replace the 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 services of these different kinds of bees with robots of different sorts? Um, you know, maybe at some scales and in some context, this becomes a real realistic thing. I mean, people are investing in the patents. And so I think commercially, there must be some sense that there's viability to, to doing this at some scale. But, but at the same time, it also feels like extraordinary hubris uh, to build a future where rather than relying on nature, we imagine we can just better nature. Yeah, it, it makes me uneasy. Um, 
I had a, it's not quite the same thing because bees are super essential for things, but I had a conversation recently with Jack Ashby about, uh, he wrote a great book on the platypus and many of the mammals in um, Australia. And <clears throat> he talked about, he wrote a piece on it and he, it's mentioned, uh, this piece of it isn't mentioned in the book, but the animal is mentioned. You know, he talks about the thylacine and he also talks about the, the mammoth as well. And he wrote a piece recently about many of the issues of trying to revive or resurrect an extinct animal. Now, granted, you know, we, the animal hasn't been extinct that long. And even some people said that there were sightings of the, the animal, you know, as much as 20 years ago or whatever, but it, it's not quite the same thing. It's not a one-to-one, -one. but I do get a little uneasy about, you know, intervening too much into the natural order of things with bees. Now, granted, I mean, if we, we've, kill too many bees or their environments or things like that we have to take the l on that one i think right and that's that's on us but i trying to say well how do we how do we rectify this well sometimes you i don't think you can and i don't think you should and now, i don't know i mean right again i don't i don't have all of the the ethical answers here but it, it, there's something and it's not because it's just you know afraid of you know alternative ways of looking at things using technology with our our environment but it, there's something about it that feels not quite right. Um, I don't know if that's just my instinct or things like that, but it doesn't seem like it would be, I, I could see having a lot of uh, problems with it that we, we don't fully understand. And, and what would that say for the bees that are still already out there? And I, I don't know. I, I think there's just too many unknowns to, to do something like that, you know, full yeah, scale. You know, I mean, I think realistically, you know, if I think in, t in 10 years, realistically, the odds that you have an AI bee that does it, that's as effective as a, you know, a honeybee and in, in pollinating or it's, it's not, it's not a trivial technical challenge. But I also think about, um, well, let's think about like, if you have a bunch of potted plants in your apartment and you'd like for them to be pollinated and you have a little AI bee that flies around your apartment. That's a different scale than if you think about. Sure, we're going to pollinate fields, all of, the, all of the almonds in California <laughs> using using a hundred, probably even more, you know, half a billion tiny drones to do it. Yeah, um, yeah. In in that case, they're directly competing with the bees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're actually creating a scenario in which your artificial bees are precipitating the extinction of the real bees mm -hmm. and and uh that's a fascinating and slippery slope that i don't think we've really even begun to um think through the implications of um but it's it mean, it's very it's very interesting it would be it would be really interesting to me to hear a philosopher uh I mean, ethicist and a philosopher talk about this question: How do we think about ecosystems in which whole pieces have been replaced by technology? What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. What should we do? Um, and I guess in the book, what I do with this is I just lift up the reality that historically we've not been very good at this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have a good track record. <laughs> <laughs> track record's not great it's not the um, best it's not the best and so a little hum at the very least a little humility would be useful well humans aren't always the best at that but i agree with you uh it is something i will ask lars about i'm sure he has certain ideas about it as well so yeah i think i think it is really really important so let's uh let's let's uh, kind of uh bring it home here and we'll talk about well, let's talk about climate change. Let's just talk about it directly. Um, you know, obviously I have all these, these questions about what the future of humanity looks like on the earth. What does the future and history of the planet look like? Um, and I think this is where you start talking about convergent evolution and things like that. We're going to lose those work, but, um, so obviously with that, we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, dialogue about climate change. Now let's try and table the political aspects of it aside it, it's quite frustrating how politicized it's become uh and i have my own ideas about how and why that's that is and you know who's to blame and sort of things but 
I guess the, you know, if you take one view of this, climate change is, is something that happens. The climate is always changing. It always has on the 4 billion years the earth has been around. We've had, I mean, we're still coming out of an ice age in the grand scheme of things on the, on the scale, on the timeline of, of, of the earth's uh, history. Um, we've had five extinctions. You know, so this just happens, right? The, 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 how, how the earth is, is, is working. Like the climate is always changing. Now, the, if you scale all the way upwards, you know, for some folks, you know, this is absolutely a hundred percent, you know, or majority, you know, the percentage is humans fault. It's all of our things, our emissions, you know, the thing with the ozone layer, acidification of the oceans, you know, so on and so forth, all, all the way down to, you know, turtles and plastic straws and, and just the whole thing, right? It's all humans fault, you know, we're to blame. And, and then on the other side, you have people, well, you have other people that will say like, well, it's, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not really happening. It's not a big deal. Some people kind of to just to the, the, the center of that will say, yeah, it's happening. Some human involvement, but we just got to adapt to it. That's all we got to do. We just got to adapt. You know, that's, that's what we do. We adapt. The earth's going to keep going. And I guess just in everything we've discussed, you know, when you're talking about <clears throat> a natural history of our planet and where it goes, um, with us involved, you mentioned earlier that at some point we'll be, uh, humans will be extinct, uh, as all species are, um, hopefully, uh, not sooner than later, <laughs> or let, let's not, let's not, you know, you know, speed that, put that on fast forward, hopefully, but yeah, I've got um, a couple of good lunches and some concerts coming up. Yeah, so. I really, I do too. I, I really, I really would not want to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, how do you, I mean, I really, really am curious, I mean, based on obviously your, your, your background and, you know, what you've written about, where you, what's your kind of, um, you know, how do you, how you navigate through this idea of, uh, or not this idea, but this reality of climate change and maybe some of the, the noise about it on both sides and, you know, kind of what your ideas are about this and then what that looks like as we turn towards our, our future for, for humans and, and the planet? Yeah, b big set of questions. So um, in my experience, the, um, how people talk about climate change, well, the extent to which people are willing to accept that the climate is changing often depends on how you talk about it. Um, and so a farmer who, who might not engage the politicized version of discussions of climate change might nonetheless recognize that what she or he is farming can no longer be the same things that were farmed a couple of decades ago. And, and so I think more people are, are seeing and feeling climate change then might say so in a, you know, when, when asked using terms that have become politicized. Um, and so is that hopeful? Like, I don't know if that's hopeful or if it's just <laughs> reality is, is, is striking many people. At the same time, you know, if you listen to people's responses to the aftermath of Hurricane Ian, um, which was clearly worsened by sea level rise, uh, as will be subsequent hurricanes that hit that part of Florida, mm. you know, there was a lot of talk about, well, this was a one, one in a thousand year hurricane. What are the odds that'll happen again next year? Um, well, much higher than they used to be, but, but for a variety of reasons, we seem really unable to accommodate the idea of future change into our daily lives. And sometimes it's because people don't believe the data. But in other cases, people, you know, under, have a sense of what's happening. But still, there's this disconnection between daily decisions and the future. Can I, can I, can I jump in there about some of the psychology of that, I think? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think some of that is because 
on the one hand, it's this idea of many humans and many humans, I guess now in modern society are just very reactionary to things, right? If I don't see it, if I don't hear it, it doesn't exist, even though they maybe know they, that and it does. And people are just react until there's a problem. I mean, people raise their kids this way, right? Well, if there's no problem with you, if there's no fire to put out, you're fine, right? Um, you have the opposite extreme, right? Where they're, you know, just helicoptering over everything. But a lot of people, a lot of people are reactionary. I mean, and, and I, and I, and a lot of people, I think I've, I've really warmed up to this idea, which is pessimistic and it makes me, you know, feel terrible, but I don't think people really care about the truth anymore. I think, I think, I think they, 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 um, and this could be a problem of too much information, information overload, you know, all these things, but I think people care. They, they'll say they care about it, but they really just care about, you know, their feelings, how they react to things. And, and that's, what's most important enough to make their decisions. Now, obviously those things are important, but I think they shouldn't be obfuscating decision-making sometimes. The second part of that, which is deeper is I think people, we have an incredible way. And I think there's some part of our evolutionary code of, you know, having aspects of self-deception and denial. And I think if we understand aspects of our future that maybe aren't so good, such as the fact that, you know, at some point this universe won't exist, at some point, you know, the sun will explode, at some point earth won't be here, at some point humans won't be here, and at some point I'll die, you know, you'll die. All of those things, no matter how far you put it on the scale or how close you put it, is just terrifying. People don't like that. And there's these ways of self-deception. So I think people will say, like, I don't want to think about the planet, you know, increasing by however many degrees. I don't want to think about water raising, you know, and, and for sure, there are people that really just go overboard with this. And then, so then people don't want to listen to those folks anymore. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, I, I think there's some bit of that. I think there's some of this reactionary, some of it's overly emotional, that's some impairing de decision making. And then another part of this is, it's just this self-deception, people, this denial of, ah, I don't want to think about that. Ah, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Um, we saw that even with something like, you know, uh, the pandemic and the, and the virus and people were doing that. And, and again, I also, when people have been hearing about this on, 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 uh, kind of on steroids the past couple of years, just overdrive, people get fatigued. It's less, you know, they, there's just kind of tune out. And so there's that, there's some kind of apathy that sits there. So I think you have all these things where people just are less, uh, I don't want to say impressed, but they're just less interested, I think, in some of these things. That, that's how I kind of see it. Now, you, you might see it differently or disagree, but I, as I've been thinking about these things, you know, and having conversations and reading things, it feels like these are the kind of variables in play. Uh, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I mean, I, um, I agree that those kinds of variables are in play, that we, we struggle with big time scales or even intermediate time scales. You know, our news cycles are hourly, our... Um, you know, our businesses are run quarterly. Our universities, if they have a long-term plan, it's 10 years. Um, and so if tomorrow is not going to be different from today, you know, we make so many decisions day to day. And, and I mean, I, I relate to that. I mean, it's just, you know, got to figure out stuff for tomorrow. And so I think, you know, one of the things that we can do is to make more coherent what these different predictions mean for people's daily lives. And so we did a Matt Fitzpatrick at the University of Maryland um, and I did a project where we use climate um, models to predict which existing city, different cities in, in North America will be most like in terms of climate in the future. And this really resonated with people. And I think the reason it resonated is because people could relate to those other cities. Well, I live in Raleigh, but future Raleigh is going to be like Tampa. Well, I kind of remember what Tampa was like. Hmm. And knowing what Tampa is like, you can start to take some actions. 
you can start to think, well, the things that grow in Tampa might grow in my yard. I can plant that cactus I always wanted. Um, by that same token, if you're thinking about your heating and cooling, and you're going to invest in reimagining your, your house, that change is happening fast enough that you should be planning with that in mind, and you can do it a little bit. And so I think, and if you're a city planner, you also know that, well, Tampa's got way more uh, disease-causing mosquitoes than Raleigh does. So we're going to have to deal with that. Mm. So I think providing people with tools that allow them to think about these big changes in units that they can relate to their daily actions, um, it's got to be part of it, and it's not sufficient. And uh, we need way more psychologists helping us to think about um, these things and experts in communication and rhetoric. We need the same money to go into making, conveying these ideas and thinking about them that went into selling big tobacco. Yeah. You know, yeah. Big tobacco was in charge of, of helping people to understand the changes that were coming and how to mitigate them. We, well, if, the, if we had the money from big tobacco and we had their best ad people, you know, I think we could be doing some amazing stuff. Yeah. Well, I think I, the other reality is, uh, we have a lot of choice still in which scenarios we're, we're heading down. Mm. And so I think, you know, for each of us to think through, like, which of these scenarios do I want? You know, which of these are the scenarios I'd like to be part of and or complicit in? Mm -hmm. And in the early models, those scenarios were just about what the climate was. And that's really abstract. Yeah. But now we know, like, what, well, what's the sea level rise going to be? Which bird species? Which plant species? Mm. And to start having bigger conversations about which of those scenarios we want. Mm. And, and here, I think the universities can play a much bigger role than we have. Mm. You know, engaging our students, not in just doom and gloom, but look, these are the scenarios you can be a part of, of engineering. Um, what do you think we should be heading toward? And then what do those first steps look like? Um, yeah, and- I, I fully agree on that point. I, I think that there's too much of a doom and gloom or so many things, again, are reactionary or the anti or whatever. And I think it's, it's really important to say, okay, here's some of the facts. You know, here's some of the things, we, the tangible things we know. So how do we operate in that world? And how do we, how do we, um, how do we make sure that we're able to, to, to uh, you know, decide how we want to do that. So I, I fully agree. So I guess the, the last question I have for you here is paint us a picture, right? You know, you don't have to go full sci-fi, <laughs> but what does the future of the earth look like with us in it, with us not in it? You do a little bit of this in the end of the book. Just what does the future and history of, of the planet look like? And, and you know, what, what kind of, you know, future can we envision of sorts? Well, I mean, I- I've already talked a little bit about, well, so I'll start with the, the long future. So at some point, humans go extinct and evolution continues. And so it's really interesting to think about which species evolve, what can we predict, what can we not predict? And I'll point people to the book for, for that one. And so I'll, I'll turn instead to the, the slightly more immediate and, and more hopeful. And, and imagine we were to create cities where the buildings themselves were photosynthetic. They were made of self-healing concretes that relied on microbes to make them. That the buildings were covered with living ecosystems, mm. with species that we found to be beautiful and that benefited us. That we're on 100% uh, renewable energy. We have negative emissions. And we are surrounded by microbe species that help to keep your immune systems happy. And we're seeing unfold all around us the evolution of other species in which we find joy and benefit. We know enough to embark on that future. Now, would it be tricky? Are there all sorts of things we have to measure we haven't measured yet? Certainly. But, we, but that's not a, a future that's impossible, even in the relatively near future. On the other hand, 
I mean, I could just leave us there, right? So there's, <laughs> we can do amazing things in that landscape. That landscape sits in contrast to our default scenario where we have largely gray cities where the species that are evolving are species that evolve despite us, that eat of us, where the species that we've brought along on our inadvertent arc are largely species that are to our detriment. And we've replaced natural ecosystems with engineered versions that don't carry out the services we need in the fullness that the wild versions once did. And I think that's our, our default scenario is something along those lines. But we're at a moment in history when we maintain the ability to imagine far more interesting futures. But to do it, we need ecologists and evolutionary biologists talking to engineers, to architects, to speculative fiction writers, to sociologists. We need a holistic coming together around which future we want and how we use all of our best and brightest to carry off that kind of future. And I think for me, the great hope there is we don't have to do it globally all at once. Mm -hmm. We imagine our first most beautiful city other people will build their second most beautiful city very quickly. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I absolutely agree with that. Well, look, Rob, I mean, uh, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, the book is called a natural history of the future. What the laws of biology tell us about the destiny of the human species. I know it's out everywhere. It's in, it's in hardcover. Is it in paperback yet or coming soon? It's it's a paperbacks coming soon and I should know the date, but it's soon. (laughs) Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. Um, everyone should definitely pick it up and where can uh, people find you, whether on social media or your website or online or anything like that uh my website's just rob dunn lab if you type that in you'll you'll get it and um my my current role is i'm a senior vice provost of university interdisciplinary programs at nc state and so part of my job is to figure out how we as a university do some of these things that i keep saying society at large Mm. uh, should do so check back and see if i (laughs) ask where my mouth is (laughs) <laughs> that's great well look again i mean this was such a thought-provoking uh really really enriching uh and just fabulous conversation i was really deeply rewarded by it and and i really thank you for for, for coming on and talking with me for a couple hours and for the work you do so just a big big thanks for that what, what, what a pleasure Th- thank you so much hope you have a wonderful evening all righty thank you <laughs>